Welcome everyone. I'm here with my friend Javier, who's also a member of the Halcyon Guild. Javier and I have been speaking for I think half a year or so. Been to some of my courses and uh, you're very active in your own right. You write poems um, and Javier is also in dialogue with others like Daniel Zaruba and Guy Sengstock and um, I think currently you read a lot of poetry and literature. So we'll today try and uh, traverse through the dwelling ground, the meeting place, as you called the cosmos. Maybe you can also say something on this. This was beautiful in the early Greek seminar that the cosmos is the uh, meeting place um, of, well, of poetry and thinking or dichten and uh, denken poetizing and thinking poetry and philosophy. Maybe just as a side note, uh, Goethe's autobiography is called in German Dichtung und Wahrheit, which is usually translated as poetry and truth, but there's something lost in translation, which is that Dichtung, of course, can mean poetry, but Dichtung can also mean made up, invented. Uh, so a, a dichter, as uh, a poet, as also Aristotle knew, Nietzsche quotes him on this, um, poets like to lie. <laughs> um, but so Goethe was aware that also in Dichtung there can be a sense of perhaps uh, fancy or uh, not straightforward, not straight out lying, but certain perhaps uh, a danger in poetry also, that the poet can make something up. On the other hand, of course, the poet can more immediately say and see sometimes what is and what is not, which is why Hölderlin out of the Trinity of Tübingen, Hölderlin was friends and roommates with Hegel and Schelling at the same time in Tübingen. And Hölderlin broke away from his two friends, the other two theologians, and became the poet of um, the three because he thought that poetry is sovereign over, over uh, philosophy, because poetry can say more directly and more immediately can speak of the gods, mortals, earth, and sky, the fourfold which Heidegger picks up on and which in Hölderlin we find in the poem Leisure, for example, Die Muse, or in the Rhine, of course. And I'll, I will today um, read an excerpt from T.S. Eliot's collected poems, uh, Mr. Eliot's Sunday morning service. I will read the first two stanzas and then I'll read a poem of mine, which is quite short. The first word is very difficult to pronounce. Polyphiloprogenitive. That the sapient subtlest of the Lord drift across the window panes. In the beginning was the word. Enache en hologos. So this is a quote from Tron in the Bible. In the beginning was the word. Superfitation of to pen, the one in Greek. And at the mensual turn of time produced innovate origin. This is Elliot, his Sunday service, and here's mine, which I wrote in Bangkok of all places, in the Oriental Hotel, sitting by the river, <laughs> drinking a beer. In some caves, water drips, drips down living stones, flowing towards the shadows. In some caves, water drips on flickering flames, their burning light untouched. The water trips, not unlike tears, down the eons, aye, and out in circles round a sphere, never though does the water leave the cave, for no one ever does. Mm -hmm. so. Like that one. <clears throat> The word. 
Yeah, and the one. And the one. Hmm. You know, I don't I don't know if you have these these experiences, Johannes, but when I often write poetry, yeah. um, and, and I, I've begun to distinguish these moments where I can see the criticism about why poetry can be a lie um, in, in terms of the, these, these moments where I, I think that I know what I am saying. Yeah. Um, but then I've also been experimenting with, uh, as I've been telling you before the recording, that yeah. I've been doing it as a spiritual practice. <laughs> yeah. And now when I'm writing, I don't, I, I have to admit to myself, I have no idea what I'm saying. I, I just have absolutely no idea what I'm saying. It's, I am being a complete witness to myself when I'm writing these, these words now. I've only posted a couple of them recently, but, and I'm, and I'll be sitting there and I'll be like, I, you know, if someone were to come to me and be like, well, what does this mean? I would be lying to you if I really told you what I think it meant, <laughs> you know? Um, but there is a sense of, of truth in there. And I think that's what, what's special about it in, in and sort of writing it, I guess, I don't know, it, it, it's either the work cannot be separate from the, the person. So it's either you truly being sincere to yourself when you're writing these things, sincere to yourself, to truth, as you deem it, or are you sort of engaging in some other avenue? Um, and I think that's where poetry gets dangerous. And in the letters to a young poet by Rilke, yeah, um, he 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 doesn't critique the young poet in the letters, but he says that he goes, you know, I can tell, I can tell that none of this is you, that what you're writing, none of it is you. Yeah. It's 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 all a fluke. It's none of it is you. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and and so I, I think this is very important um, mm -hmm. when we talk about poetry because there seems to be a lot of poetry. Um, and I, I was a victim of this too when I began to start yeah. is that I just, we, we, we gauge it outward, right? What, what is it somebody's going to like it? How is somebody going to like it? That's a lie. <laughs> that is a lie. Like That's to, the lie, yeah. yeah. That, that is the lie to write something for somebody else's eyes um, with, with the intention for somebody else's eyes. That's the lie. Um, oh, at least that's part of the lie. I think there's probably a deeper lie, and I don't really quite know it yet. <laughs> um, I think maybe it's, it's it's these moments of like you're confessing to yourself, but then you're lying to yourself in the middle of your confessions. Um. <laughs> yeah, you're you're confessing to the priest. Yes, the priest, yes, yes. The priest may want to hear. Yeah, and and I started looking at my poetry like confessions. Um, I think I think one night I was frustrated. I even wrote just like a little like a little prose. I said, <laughs> I said, why are you why are you being insincere <laughs> when you write these things about yourself? <laughs> you know? I, yeah. I kind of wrote it out, um, and it's you know it's because again we're I'm, I'm, I catch myself in this loop of eventually I want this poetry to be published. And so, but it becomes a mental block in my mind yeah, about yeah, yeah. Um, how it's going to be perceived, how uh, it needs to be in certain ways. But then at the same time, I have to ask myself in a deeper sense, what is this all for? Really? What is this all for? Um, is it just because I want recognition? If I want recognition, then I, I should be very well prepared for the criticism and everything that comes with it. Um, but then I was like, but is that really why I write poetry? Is that really why I write poetry? Or is there something that there's this meeting place that I want to come to between myself and, and truth and, and the things that I do not understand? And so I feel like poetry is that avenue that 
can can hopefully get you there. <laughs> you know. I'll read again. In the beginning was the word. And he repeats, in the beginning was the word. Superfetation of Tohen, the one. Why do I repeat it? Perhaps because that in the beginning is the word, was the word, is whatever he meant to say, this is, you know, it's Mr. Eliot's Sunday morning service, but he's of course also a poet, maybe um, not exclusively, but also addressing himself or poetry itself. And perhaps that's a warning that what, be, what, be, what begins any poem that doesn't look, that doesn't write for an imagined reader, or readership, or or some kind of an imagined audience, but it responds itself to the word and the the fruitfulness and this richness of of the one that we've been discussing so often, and uh, what unfolds from it. And I think the way you phrased it was, you, you said it could be a lie then, but then you said there might even be a, a deeper lie. I wonder what that might be. But then on the other hand, is it perhaps, you know, to use an old word, dissimulation? Is it a, dissim, a dissimulatio when we write for, for an imagined audience? Or is it, to come back to Goethe, Goethe thought that the Romantics, um, whom he didn't really didn't believe really, he wasn't really uh, too uh, excited about people like him, the Schlegel brothers and Kleist and others. Why? Because the Romantics, he thought, dreamt up uh, a fancy, a utopia, you could even say, not quite good as words, but something along those lines, which reality or, or life could never could never really achieve, could never become. And so for Goethe, the task of the poet was to be able to see, yes, what, what is life, reality, actuality, but then to give what is not yet formed poetically, to give poetical form to the poet, to the real. So that the real also stands there, still as the real, it is not changing its matter, but it has changed its form. And therefore also one could say it has changed its, con it has a, an altered at least, or a, an elevated content. Yeah, that's, that, that almost rings well with what I had read about Albert Camus criticism with a lot of philosophers, how he says that when we the 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 fancy, right, the 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 the, the lies that get told for Albert Camus is what he calls philosophical suicide, is when we try to take what we can't understand with reality and then somehow make up this gap um, between there. Um, to then make it correspond and be like, well, this is what reality is. Um, this this will be the answer. And and I think I think maybe perhaps that that might be the bigger lie for the poet, um, because I do catch myself sometimes if you know in these moments of I'm trying to make sense of my reality rather than just being a witness to it. So what's the difference? <laughs> what's the difference between writing, being a witness to my reality, um, and then just trying to make sense of my reality? And and I, I still think, you know, I'm still too too new to this concept to even really make a confident distinction between the two right now for myself. Um, so it, it comes with this letting go constantly, 
<laughs> I'm constantly letting go of something that uh, I find what I thought was true all the time. So the, so I go back to the word again. <laughs> the word, it, it like, it resets itself for me. We say like the word is the beginning. Every morning for me, it's that same moment. <laughs> the word, there was the word, begin again. And then I construct some maddening thread to connect to reality. And then I wake up the next morning and the word begins. And I have to let go of that last one. <laughs> um, and I think it's, yeah, I, I think maybe, maybe, I don't know. It, I often try to reason with myself about when I'm writing poetry, am I trying to do the same thing that every other, you know, a lot of philosophers are trying to do where you, you try to reach some gap and, and you are trying to make up the gap. And then you say, this is what reality is. Um, and then, but the question is, are you really seeing things as they are? Or are you wishing them to be as they are, as something else? That's, yeah. That's probably the, the self-critical moment then for the poet as much as maybe the thinker or the philosopher to question oneself consistently, constantly, whether what one sees, what is it that the philosopher does? The philosopher sees, as we know from, from Plato, maybe also here, so we take Heraclitus into account. Um, but the, the, the question is, but you may think you've almost said it, that the exercise lies in, in the continuous return to the word and the saying it again and attempting to say it again. Um, not describing a set of a, a given object that can be exhausted by some informational value descriptor or so, but in a way uh, approaching what shows itself, and you mentioned letting go, by letting it occur and by letting it show itself, which strangely enough does happen for us in language and how we respond to it. So you could almost say that perhaps it's a, and to, to take what you said and put it in different words, to heed language and our words and let them also, because this is also a distinction, of course, sometimes, you know, for some writers, there is interiority. And for others, like you could, you could say for Heidegger, there is no interiority. He's, he's following the word. He's following language itself, not describing anything of uh, subjective um, content or so but simply trying to see what, what happens when the word itself speaks to us. What is its origin? What else is in there? Why does it have a certain word, like Eignis, for example, or Wesen in German? Why does it have ambiguous meanings? Um, can they be brought, can they be, not synthesized, but can they be brought together or uh, combined? or in, in a fruitful way, even if they're completely at odds with, with each other. Um, and then perhaps there's a, yeah, in, in this continuous self, in this practice, there's, a, there's a, a, a chance not to fall into a fancy, but at the same time, of course, the, the poet perhaps also has the, sometimes the task to not to dream up, Perhaps, but to to um, to at least see um, another way of of being that is not currently prevalent, um, and that you know. So the question, of course, is what's the role of poetry, anyways, these days? Uh, where is it? Where does it reside? Does poetry still have a place? Uh, if not, why is that not the case? Why is why do why don't why do we trust a uh, some model or some graphs or some numbers on the screen better than the description of a poetry of what life is or what being means. So yeah, that would be just some 
some thoughts. I've, it's funny because when you think about, we've heard about this. I don't know if you've heard about this. Uh, this called yeah. Insta poetry, right? Where the, the the popular thing in Instagram is to make your words as short, concise, readable for those one second that you're going to look at the screen and then scroll by it. Yeah. Um, which gives very little thought at all. Um, and, and then to like it, right? This is what they like to call Insta poetry. <laughs> but the longer it is, oh my goodness, the longer it is, it's a sin. <laughs> you know, it's a sin if you make it any longer. Um, they have to truly love you if they want to read the entire words. Um, so what what is good, you could say, about doing this is that it makes people want to read poetry. However, by doing this, I feel now I have to question then what is poetry at this point in, in, a, in, a, in a real way. Now we could always say um, it's subjective what poetry is. And that's, you know, for, for, some, for me, sometimes that's fine. I can accept that argument. However, when it comes to truth, truth demands something a little bit more about it truth sets conditions upon the poet and upon the philosopher i have to meet those conditions when i read little snippets of innocent poetry i can tell that truth is not their their condition maker they're the ones setting the conditions um they don't they don't feel that same frustration that one feels when one is trying to pin truth down or meet truth in poetry. Um, when I write poetry, I, I really try to, I almost refrain from even saying my own experiences. What I'm trying to, what I'm trying to gauge at is just this ambiguousness that I, that, that I witness. And I wanted to say more than what I've been conscious of most of my, my daily life, my worlding life that I'm so barely conscious about. And so suddenly I gather myself in that one moment to write poetry down. And then I just become a witness and I go, what, what did I just write? <laughs> you know? Um, so th these questions, I think it makes it more accessible, but there's the danger by making it more accessible. By making it more accessible, I, I read very shallow things. It's not that I don't want to read about people's experiences, but at the end of the day, I want to read something that it makes me like mull over like constantly. Like I'm just thinking about like, even like your poem, like I'm just thinking about that dripping water into the fire. Like, what is that? Like, you know, it, it, it makes you, it really makes you gather yourself there for a moment and stand in. And it reminds me of something that Marcel Proust wrote um, when he was talking about his experiences reading by the tree and how his grandmother would critique him for wasting his day away and not experiencing the world. But he said, little did she know that me sitting reading by the tree, I was perfectly positioned to feel in this perfect repose, the activity of all of life between my book and between the activities around me, right? Um, to me, that is very similar to my aim in, in writing poetry. I want to provoke some kind of repose where you are just a hand dipped into the, the fountain of water and you're just sitting there letting the, the currents go through it, right? I don't know what that means, but I feel it. <laughs> and I have to return to it just to keep trying to say it again. And, and to me, if we want to say that's what the word is, then to me, that's what the word is. Um, just You're just sitting your hand there, feeling the, the water drip through your hands. And again, I can't explain it to you, but I can only gather myself and, and try to describe it to you the, the way that I can. 
And again, I will find it insufficient and then I will return to it again and try to explain it, <laughs> describe it to you. So, so maybe I'm, that answers yeah, the question ahead. a little bit. I'm not surprised that there is something what you what you just described, the in, it's striking that and this is so obvious that I feel almost uh, too tired to say it, um, that uh, the informational websites, the big ones, the encyclopedias, um, et cetera, that are dominating the web are geared towards what they call disambiguity. And that there's something quite striking there to notice about that it's all this should be give us this should give us a warning about how language is here not just you know abstractly understood but how language is here reinterpreted as something that must not have any ambiguity my father for example grew up in a small village in bavaria uh, where a dialogue dialect is a war spoken which is slowly dying now which is spoken in this village and maybe in a couple of other villages and that's it and the little he still remembers from that language because it is its own language is the ambiguity of words is that it was very often it depended on the situation and even then you couldn't really Fully ever, it always meant at least two had two or three different meanings at once, and this is uh, so. This kind of make everything this um, ambiguous, make it punchy and on point is, an, to my mind, is an assault on language, and is an assault, an attack on our thinking, and um, is uh, has a certain function in a certain role within certain prevalent so, structures. I would, at the same time, and this is why I said I'm almost too tired to say it, um, because it, to me it's obvious, but maybe it's not obvious, but at the same time, the long format recording that has no structured, so, you know, we leap into a dialogue, we don't know where it's going. We've read something. I've been reading Goethe, you've been reading Rilke and Proust and Camus, and uh, read a bit of Eliot, and then we leap into this. So there is a way, I mean, I would almost say, you know, for someone who, who is on, on this platform you mentioned, just do the complete opposite. Just publish epic 10 page poems uh, and, and uh, distort the algorithm a bit just for the just for the sake of it just for the, the just for the laughs um, it's it, it's 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 so bizarre though what what this does to language because it, it 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 assumes that every single word and it's most often that of course it's English and it's English everywhere whether that be in all of Europe, Latin America, uh, Africa, it's always going to be even their languages, French, Italian, Spanish, uh, Mandarin, uh, Russian, whatever. And that, you know, especially the English language, which is so rich, actually, is coming down to a few buzzwords. And I wonder, I mean, we, we could wonder about what it does to us, but also, as you mentioned, which is much more important, where, so there is poetry, apparently, um, and it is this kind of silly, uh, silly poetry that we don't have to really consider. But it, 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 it. I think it does say something that we are, we don't trust a poet to tell us something about nature, for example, or life, or meaning. If it's ambiguous in a way that we're not used to, that this could be true. So that in ambiguity we could find truth or to <clears throat> quote Heidegger that in art truth happens or occurs because something is disclosed to us that is usually hidden or concealed. 
and then you mentioned re repose rest or giving giving pause um a, a cause to rest repose i mean one could almost perhaps even say is almost like a, a refuge then and it's in some sense connected to scolaire is in some sense connected to 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 leisure i don't really like the word leisure but to um to a uh, a place um of of rest and the way you've described it i think was that it is in writing poetry or a, a poem more specifically you create a place of repose and rest and calm and withdrawal that is um not immediately that cannot be sort of taken away also yeah that's <clears throat> it, <laughs> it, that's something i've been thinking about a lot this this idea of positionality and then truth um, and we assume that the correct position is to be non-ambiguous, <laughs> to be concise with our words. And it's funny yeah. because I've been having more conversations with my coworkers, and they have this very fear of groundlessness. They don't like this. They don't like this fear of groundlessness. When I, when I would just curi curiously question assumptions, things that are obvious, clearly obvious. One, you look like a madman to all of them, but they they begin to see, and you can almost see like the fear in their own eyes that if I refute this claim or I show that it has some kind of flaw, um, they don't know where to grip. They don't know where, where to grip next. Um, and I find that a very, <laughs> well, I think it's it's been throughout all of history of philosophy as well, maybe. Um, the people that don't read philosophy and read poetry. Um, well, actually, I don't know. It, you know, philosophy, I always find myself on this groundless ground, right? But then when I read poetry, even though it's so ambiguous, I found myself grounded somehow. But it's unexplainable in some way. It it does put me in that state of repose that I'm talking about, but I, I can't explain it. When someone says, well, where where is your ground? I, I don't know where is my ground, but I feel grounded. Um, I can't explain it to you because it's almost like there's a the sacred element to it. Like if I say it, then it's not it. <laughs> if I tell you that's what it is, it's not it. It evaporates. Yes, it evaporates. Uh, I think Marcel Proust described it perfectly one time. He's like, it's like an incandescent body approaching water he's like it will just evaporate before it even meets the water <laughs> and is it is it a, a ground that itself is a with a, an elusive ground a withdrawing ground a ground that is that requires itself constant attempts at grounding is it a ground that is aware to speak with Heidegger of the the nullity of existence, uh, yeah. of of its own finitude? Um, so are you? But you know. So you know because then the other other question is: Are we trying to pull ourselves out of the the swamp like Baron Baron uh, Munchausen? Um, but no, that's that's not it. I think. I think I think it's because we assume the ground's dead for some reason. We assume the ground's dead, so it's like it doesn't move. You know, it's just everything's dead. I mean, you can describe things that are dead perfectly. It's <laughs> dead. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Exactly. No. No. It's super. Because this is what formal logic does. Formal mm. logic is, is is exactly it. Formal logic, and I'm just when you while you were speaking, that I just saw, I saw, I saw, the the tunnel. I saw the tunnel, of. You know, here's your quote for the day that keeps you motivated. Uh, and, and here's here's the podcast for the day that's so unambiguous and keeps you motivated. And I saw the tunnel. I saw the tunnel of the dead ground. And formal logic, just to maybe finish this briefly, is 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 dead 
and it describes what is dead, um, it actually does not give form to something that's alive, but sterilizes what could be alive and kills off what still, you know, at least has some some heartbeat uh, left. And of course, you know, it's a tool. And as you know, the harder the hammer or the sharper the knife, the better the tool. And it's, it, yeah, so I just, so perhaps this, what you're describing, what we're then circling around uh, is, is this kind of, is a dead, kind of a deadening language that at the same time, weirdly enough, gives something to hold on to. But of course, it must be renewed every day, right? It's not enough. You need a new quote every day and a new content every day to keep keep uh, keep walking that that sterilized unground which can flip over very quickly as you mentioned when you just ask a few questions well what but as you know what is you know that that could be complete but i don't know don't ask <laughs> what don't ask what is <laughs> tito on as as uh Aristotle said, Titon, what what are beings? What is being? Yeah, it's it, it's funny because I'll be at work and people will give all these their, their all their opinion and everything. And I'm still sitting there, I'm just ruminating and I'm going, you know, I still don't know what the human being is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, we've 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 gone from we've we've made leaps. And I'm still stuck on the most fundamental question for myself is I don't even know what a human being is. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but but to go back to the ground, um, yes, I I think that's 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 what it is. It's it's this. People tell me facts, and I'm like, you know, the moment you say a fact to me, it's like describing a dead person. Um, it's like yes, I saw him. Yes, he's lying dead in the the waters right now. Yes. But when we want to talk about life. We have to talk about something living. And I can't describe it to you because it would only be in a momentary pulse of what I just described. Just this moment, momentary beat that I experienced. That that's what that's what that was the moment, that was the pulsing of my experience. And and that's it. Um, you know, I think about when you when you actually feel your own pulse. I mean, <laughs> if I were to say, this specific pulse is you, Johannes. This specific one momentary beat is you. I would, I would be actually lying at that point because it's that that one pulse is not you. It's the, it's the just the streaming of pulses that, that is what is just, just leaking through from Johannes. You so know. what you're describing is that this <laughs> pulse is. The, the, in the first instance, is a is a representation mm -hmm. of the streaming of pulses of heartbeat of living um, and dying and crying and everything else. Um, <laughs> to reduce someone to a heartbeat is pretty cruel, <laughs> um, but you know why not? It's what we do. But so the representation of it is strangely enough, it's the representation that gives, and that's so often the case, mm -hmm. isn't it? That that's what gives a grounding, or it pretends to to give something to hold mm -hmm. on to. But it is then in the language that is often not representational, but still speaking perhaps in metaphors and wild images that can let something you know, strange unfold. For example, when you read Hölderlin, when all of a sudden he said, da werde ich zum Adler. There, all of a sudden, there I become an eagle. Mm. Or the eagle, actually, it's, it's with an article. Uh, it's, it's a very strange line, because before he describes in the poem how, how he sees nature, the liebliche Blüte, the sweet uh, blossom of the flower, da werde ich zum Adler. You're taken up, you're elevated as a reader, with the poetical eye to with the poetical ego to uh, the um, to the, the the seeing of of nature now from the perspective of the ego mm -hmm. 
no longer from the human being. And it is, it's not representational um, because no one ever becomes an eagle. Uh, so it can still have images. I don't think to so this, maybe just to make this distinction also will be perhaps mean by a representation. Representation in that sense is something that tries to corroborate a certain, and I think you said the word yourself, a certain instant uh, a certain point in time which is fixated and corroborated rather than, and this is what great poetry and, and philosophy achieves, is that it invites us even thousands of years later to read again and think through it again. It's not as to quote um, my friend Adam Robert uh, in a recent dialogue I had with him, he said it's not informational but trans formational it is forming mm. yes but not informing it's not giving you informational value but it is transformative and then it becomes something very much of we have to own up to you know the reading of a poetry of, of a poem for example isn't one that that can simply be you know well i have to oh, 6 p.m i have to get I have to read my poem now and yeah, need to get need to get it done it's time uh, if we do it this is Another question for another time, perhaps how how one can um, how one can read poetry or when or etc. But it 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 can be in a true sense. Trans and this is perhaps is so strange. I know these days that it can be transformational, but with, but without some great aha uh, effect or so. But simply um, a very silent, solemn alteration in one's being mm -hmm. for, which mm -hmm. which requires which requires perhaps a new uh, a, 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 a continued rejuvenated continuation the next day and the next day and the next day it doesn't come easy shall we say <laughs> it doesn't come cheap it doesn't come cheap um like like Rilke would say, he's like <laughs> names <laughs> name something that you remember easy and um, simple. He says really the human being loves something difficult. They only remember the difficult, um, and that says something. But yes, I, I thought the the silent transforming talk that you're talking about. I think that's so crucial there because th there is the sense that. Poetry does this, well, even when you when you read it, but you don't even realize that it's happening half the time. You're like, oh, cool, I read this poem. But I would say you can become to ex experiment with this process if you actually read the poem, the same poem, multiple times throughout the day, and even the next day encounter it again, and you will see how it even transforms itself and its meaning towards you, right? And this way, even poems itself has a sort of living, breathing assessment to it. If it if it is really like a you know like a poem from you know Rilke or any of these other great poets, um, if you read it constantly, the same poem, it's it's never the same. It's never the same for me, at least. Um, you get you get you like it's something opens in, in the in the words itself. Um, that you're like, I've never seen that before. <laughs> Even though I've been looking at the same words, I've never seen that before. I've never, I've never even, never thought about that meaning that way before or looked at it that way before. Even though I've been reading these same lines for, for so long. And it's like, I can't even pin down the, the transforming process that has already been taking within me for me to even realize at that moment because i could say what i'm actually experiencing is just the effect it's just the effect um yeah but it isn't just the effect it, it isn't uh, is it yeah no i mean <laughs> my hands are up on this one <laughs> i'm not <laughs> um <laughs> Well, I have a quote here from Rilke. Perhaps, I don't know if it's 
really uh, germane to what we were talking about, but this is um, to, he wrote this to Mimi Romanelli and uh, it's about death. He wrote a lot of letters on death. There is death in life and it astonishes me that we pretend to ignore this. Death whose unforgiving presence we experience with each change we survive because we must learn to die slowly. We must learn to die. That is all of life. To pre prepare gradually the masterpiece of a proud and supreme death, of a death where chance plays no part, of a well-made beatific and enthusiastic death of the kind the saints knew to shape. Mm. So to give some background on this. Yeah. Rilke doesn't even view death and life really at all separately yeah. too much. And with, this is what I enjoy about Rilke is that <laughs> he, he, I mean, we've, we live in this society now where everything is divided. Oh, there's death and then there's life. Um, <laughs> but death, Death, I, I, if I could not know anything, I wouldn't even say cogito irko sum. I wouldn't even say that. I would say death is all that I know, right? But the thing is, if I say that death is all that I know, it also includes life in this, in yeah. this whole thing. Yeah. And that, that's why it, it even makes me reevaluate just reading, I mean, pondering over what you just read. That no, yeah. that really people are really afraid to die. <laughs> that even uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, go on. Sir. No, uh, no, I was go just gonna say like that. Really, people are afraid to die, and they think of dying in the physical sense. Oftentimes, they think of dying in the physical sense. But I think that is just yeah. a concept that we've. I mean, that there are so many leaps. I think and assumptions that are gone from that process to say yes, that is death. Um, there's a lot of things there that I have to question about what we mean when we say that that is death. Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, this, this, this unwavering, changing, everything, pulsing, beating. Um, <laughs> it almost, I think if I remember yeah. correctly, what Heidegger says, it's like this, what's standing in, standing, standing to stand yeah. in. I, I look at the standing in now as if I'm just like placing my finger on my pulse and that's it. That's it. That's it. Nothing else. Nothing else. That's me living and dying in every beat. There's a pause. There's a, a pulse. Even in language, I've learned this recently because I guess I had a poor edu uh, English education. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. But I recently learned about stressed and unstressed syllables, right? So even in language, there's parts of my voice that go up and go down with every syllable that I pronounce. This is very similar to a pulsing beat of the human being, right? So that means even when I speak, I am pulsating with words and they're going up and down. And so this even comes back to like, not only is the word the beginning, but the word is living. The word is alive. I can't, if I describe it, well, I mean, descriptions are dead things. I can only describe dead things, really, and fully dead things. At least that's how I look at it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for, for Rilke, so this is in a letter to uh, Muson that he says uh, that death is the uh, side of life that's um, turned away from us. And one of the last poems that Heidegger writes before his death is a quote from Rilke, which is Wohnend im Tod, dwelling in death. And Heidegger wonders how this is to be possible. In a, a popular film, from recent years, I forgot what it, it's, it depicts a, an aging Sherlock Holmes. And Sherlock Holmes is, of course, you know, 
uh, a very, uh, as you know, a very rational mind, highly deductive, deduces, lives basically in a, in a syllogism. Yeah. If A, then B, therefore A. If A, then B. If B, then C. Well, then if so, A goes to C. And this is how he lives his life. When he gets older, he can't, uh, he remembers something that he lost out on or missed out on, which was someone who loved him, but he couldn't, uh, he couldn't uh, give it back. And this lady at some point in the film says to him, the dead are not very far away. They are just on the other side of the wall, which is very Rilkean, I would think. And I wonder whether there isn't a poet like Rilke, who is so stoutly aware of death and the wholeness of being is only granted to his thought when death is taken into account as the other side of being, even the side of being that is that you know influences this side of life or being that we consider to be real and while death of course is not real most of the time that this is what gives rise to such a point poignant um poetry and the, the ability to say in in his age and for his his epoch um what is and what is not it's the the vicinity to 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 uh, to death and to finitude to mortality that lets us see that there is another realm as is depicted in the, the the Sherlock Holmes film um that is not just purely rationalistic non-ambiguous deductive and uh, can be you know it's just a matter of of of, of crude problem solving but... yeah i've been i've been reading to to i've been reading some of the so there's a book called a poet's guide to life and it's about rilke and his letters um it's it's a little bit different from the, the letters to the young poet but one of his advices that are is constantly repeating is this idea of patience so i'm thinking about this this dwelling in death and his constant preaching about patience, um, this solitude that he keeps talking about, and then the way that he says that we should experience things. And he says the way that we should experience things are to feel everything, but then not catch ourselves into the, this narrowness. And I've been, for the past, I think, two days, I've been trying to figure out what does he mean by this narrowness, but I guess it would already, I, I'm starting to get a feeling about what it could be is when we talk about, you know, facts and in sort of a concise language is that we are narrowing everything down. And when we do this, there's all this that I've missed. There's everything, everything that I've missed around me. And it's, it's funny because really the function of thinking <laughs> what's dangerous about thinking is that you can catch yourself easily in this narrowness easily um and you know that's that's why i i constantly think about that that metaphor about this kind of reposing where i'm i'm just feeling everything and so dwelling in death that's that's actually like i mean we're not excluding death finally we're not excluding death we finally have positioned ourselves in a way that I'm in this repose of the pulsing activity that death emanates, maybe, you know, and then and then that is my my guiding life from there on. I don't know. Two things that come to mind um, that that are in that are just saw more clearly now again thanks to what you were saying which is you know on the one hand there's a fear of death but then there's a holding on to dead and deadening facts or slogans that give a sort of a halt but actually are dead themselves and don't give rise to 
a living outburst or is Eliot uh, calls it, you know, an, an, ener- an nerving, enervate origin, uh, a drift across the window panes. You know, you can just hear the life um, in it, but it's just, you know, a very shallow and benign, obvious nonsense. And at the same time, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in an age that is deathless, it doesn't consider finitude. And finitude means hard, just hard limits. <laughs> This is it that you you have, even if there is perhaps uh, another life or so. And however we un- however we understand, of course, this religious uh, uh, image is a, a, another uh, for another time to discuss. Perhaps whether heaven, for example, shouldn't be on on earth. Uh, but in a deathless age, to say the obvious, there is no limitation. But when there is no limitation, and that's something that you pointed out then there is no need to ripen or to be patient, to come into one's own, to be able to, to know that there's a moment to gift yourself and there's a moment to not gift anything or withdraw oneself is not given in, especially in the digital time when everything is available and, and, and readily, you know, there and, and, um, and seemingly always present um and because what to gift oneself to someone to the world uh to a community to one's art uh, or even to oneself requires patience requires understanding of the horizon the ultimate limit that's coming already there perhaps and then to then to gift oneself in the in the moment that is then unique unique but as in its uniqueness eternal it will have been forever. It will always forever have been this one moment, which, of course, as we know from Nietzsche, uh, returns in the next moment and in the next moment. But only if if we you know, begin to see this highest moment as one that can also come to pass and then cannot be repeated, cannot be just arbitrarily be uh, re, uh, made up again or reinvented or so. No, there's a moment in time where this something must occur and one must not miss it if it is one one's moment. Um, and perhaps that's that's more acute. One is more acutely aware of this in a moment or in a in, in a way of being that is also aware of of death. Yeah, there's when you said the eternity, um, there, in one of Rilke's letters, he actually says, if we would just take one moment to withdraw, basically, um, we would see that eternity is already inside of us. Eternity is already inside of us. And <laughs> and that, that, to me, that was so powerful because what he's critiquing is our constant external grasping. And he, and he questions, he goes, why are you doing this when you already have the fullness of yourself that already exists? You simply just have to be patient and to really dig deep inside of yourself to experience this eternity that he's talking about. Um, and it actually kind of reminds me, <laughs> there's a strange connection, but I, I forgot his name already, Parmenides. Parmenides, his description of the the finite, if I remember correctly, is not um, extensive. Yeah, it's not extensive. The finite for Parmenides, if I remember correctly, is actually something that's complete already. So I started thinking about this and thinking about the finite human being that is, in a sense, complete, but it just takes my time to unfold within myself Mm-hmm. Um, to realize this pulsing mm-hmm. fullness, um, this this living thing that is um, that I already have, to just experience yeah. the unfolding. Yeah, so, just to add to what you just said on Parmenides, he speaks of um, oikuklios, so well roundedness. Um, so Alithia is the is well rounded for him, so that we are always when we are at the end, also in the beginning, um, 
And when we are in the beginning, we are already at the end. Of course, this doesn't just mean to be standing still. It's actually, this. so this is the misunderstanding of Parmenides. Um, you still have to, to quote Master Eckhart, why do you go out in order to return home? Mm-hmm. The primordial image of Odysseus speaks of this also. We ha- one has to leave to return. One has to go out to be to be to see then that where one was was beginning and end in one. And however, Parmenides, this is in fragment one. Uh, Parmenides also, and I think this is the the goddess speaking to him, um, saying that the the uh, the protoi, the proton. The, the mortals in their doxas, in their opinions, um, do not have pistis. So they do not have trust. They do not trust that which is already alethes, that which is already revealed. Or, of course, when we think it more radically, that which is concealed, unconcealed. So it is there, but not so. It, but it needs to be still be unconcealed. So one needs to go out to return to where one has always been as strange as it sounds, um, which is a death in itself, isn't it? And it's only then on this well-roundedness uh, that, that, we, that we come back to us and yeah, and begin to, to, to learn what it means to ripen and grant and gift oneself in the moment that is right to grant and gift oneself and not just be um, you know, extending out into an imagined limitlessness uh, that will never leave let let one come into one's own yeah exactly it's Rilke is always talking about this idea of intensity yeah. intensity rather than extension which i i feel that's something that's that's not very often talked about this 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 what is this feeling of intensity <laughs> it's almost like i have to sort of sift through all my experiences to find the intensity i can't name it but you do know you do know when you experience this intensity that that is that is at least that is i know what is true that you do when you're sifting through all these experiences of your life there are these moments where you experience an intensity and you should stay there and rilke talks about this that you should repose yourself in there and, and 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 be there, and so he talks about this patience all the time, and he and he always says, "What what are you afraid of? If if you were just patient, what are you really afraid of? Really, what are you really afraid of?" And I think just connecting back to dwelling with uh, dwelling in death, it it really starts to connect the ideas of this patience, this living in the depth. Right, because now if I were to say that dwelling in death, then dwelling in death also has maybe an intensity, a depth, um, rather than some kind of extension that we are so often accustomed to thinking, especially in time and everything else. Um, and and so this 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 intensity and this depth, and I still, you know find myself questioning like I, I don't really know what you mean Rilke what you mean like a depth I, I'm still trying to find <laughs> is there an experience that I'm missing out that is that is depth but again this patience is very important um it's and it, very briefly the word taboo mm, means uh, sacred or forbidden intensity that one shouldn't always get close to it's of course the that that's the question is can you keep the fire burning as i've said recently um can can it, who, who can not not many can that's a that that's a genuine burnout not, not the fake burnout we have today um <laughs> so it, some can keep have the intensity someone like heidegger very likely had it nietzsche Obviously, also I think uh, Rilke. I would say in the, the the poets, Herdelin, maybe almost, but uh, uh, he was um, a very uh, uh, soft, uh, tender spirit. He writes in a letter to Schiller, uh, "I live in the winter 
which grows around me. Ah, <laughs> oh, Friedrich. No, but yeah. So the the um the the the, the intensity, but you know this is striking again. The intensity of death, which is the word death, mm -hmm. um, is one that is cast aside, but it is in this intensity perhaps where there is an utter withdrawal and non-availability, a a darkness, a darker than any night that we know. Um, where there can be no light whatsoever. Um, it is in perhaps in this intensity, getting um, close to it in thought and poetry, who knows, that um, so the, the, the roundness of being can only begin to show itself. So to come back to the well roundedness, um, that, you know, there is an unknown Parmenides. Parmenides of the, the textbook, Parmenides, who apparently says that there's no movement. I don't think that that's quite the case. Uh, Parmenides does speak, for example, also of the absent, which is just as present as that which is present. And we should trust it, he says, is just as reliable as that which is visibly or sensibly present, present. But at the same time, it is only so again, so there are these hints at that which is concealed, that, that which is absent, that which is seemingly on another side that still somehow lingers on and that gives pause and then repause uh grants a repose uh in in a and, and therefore perhaps builds a very different um a dwelling ground meeting place mm -hmm. than one which is you know actually when you think about it very confusing I mean, when you think mm -hmm. about you know scrolling through a, a thing and, and and reading different quotes that are snappy and quick, that is actually as, as seemingly grounding as it is. Perhaps it is actually quite confusing um, because it is so quick, because it is so uh, supposedly non-ambiguous, um, and it is always external to one, isn't it? It's not really coming from just addressing you in your innermost, but guiding you like a child along, you know, on a hand, on, on, but not really going in and then back out. But mm -hmm. as it is so quick, it can't really seep into your being. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's this thing about reading little snippets like that about you're just liking something you already know. Um, and, and, and people, <laughs> it's funny because I could write poetry because I've, I've done it before. Uh, I could write poetry that people would really like, right? All I got to say is, oh, well, you're so strong. You can endure. You're so, so, but that is such a, uh, it's such a, so on the surface. It's, it's like you, I want something deeper now, you know, and, and, and I've changed my writing that way as well because I want something so deep. Now, to the point that I look at it, I'll go, yeah, I don't know what that, that means, but I can, I can tell there's something there. I feel there's something there, and I want to dwell in there. I want to dwell in there for a while, and, <laughs> and so on. <laughs> but, yeah, this, it's almost like we have to reevaluate. What I like about Rilke is that he reevaluates at least what I used to believe about death, right? And we, we never question, we, we talk about death as some static thing, but to dwell in death, that's, 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 not, that, that's, not, that's not static. To dwell in death is not static at all. <laughs> and it kept Heidegger wandering until he, shortly before he died dwelling in death where are we dwelling in death i translated the poem it's on my channel um so yeah thank you javier <laughs>